So, in talking about all this stuff, there's actually a theme that kind of goes through this that I don't know if you might not have quite caught yet. Anyone? The theme is that we as humans and how we work, a lot of this depends on what are we paying attention to? What are we focusing on? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about cognetics and locus of attention. Very, very fancy words for something we do every day. All right, so let me ask you a question. What is easier to understand? The machine side of a human machine interface, in other words, the technology and how the technology works, or the human side and how humans tend to work, which you think is easier to understand and design for? Right, so that, that, that actually is correct. Typically, it's really the machine side that's easier. It's more logical, right? It tends to not be as varied as humans. You know, look at us humans. How, how, how similar are we? Right, there are some things that, yeah, they're kind of similar, but there's an enormous amount of variety. There's an enormous amount of complexity. Humans are much more complex than computer systems these days. Some will argue, well, one day computers will get there. Others will say no, because we don't even understand enough about us as humans. How are we going to, how are computers going to get there if we don't, if we're not even there with our understanding? It's actually a lot more difficult to design for a human than it is for another computer. Significantly more. Even with what we know today. Now, we have talked about a lot of things that are fairly consistent in terms of how we work as humans makes things easier. But even knowing that, there are actually a lot of human factors, a lot of things about us as humans that are actually independent of things that we may initially think are really important. So age, gender, gender is a big one, cultural background, level of expertise, there are a lot of times where you're going to be designing a system where those things don't matter at all. Okay, let's look at uh, gender and gaming. Who's familiar with gender and gaming? Who's familiar with gaming? Okay, you guys are like, yeah, I'm not going to admit this. Okay, who's heard of Portal? Yes, who thinks Portal is awesome? Yes! Okay, at least some of you will know what I'm talking about. How many of you think that only males play Portal? You guys are brilliant. The gaming industry is one that has a lot of stereotypes. When most people think of gaming, what do they think? Who's the typical gamer? Young guys. You're in your parents' basement. All you do is play games all day. How accurate is that? It's actually not accurate. Even if you take out, you're in your parents' basement. Okay, the living room. You're in your parents' living room. How accurate is that to describe even the majority of gamers, do you think? You think, you think it is. Guess what? You're wrong. Yeah, the av so the average age is much older than we think. And we've now reached a place where there are more female gamers than there are male gamers. I'm sorry? It could be. I don't play Candy Crush myself. Right? But we think of gamer, you know, gamers as these young males. And if you look at the reality, the reality is that most gamers are either neither male nor are they teenagers. Because 27 to 35 is still very young and sprightly. A young adult, yes. So if you're going to start creating and designing a game based on what you think you know about 18-year-olds, how big is your customer base compared to what, you, what it is in reality? It's smaller. That's also why gaming has evolved so much. Is there anyone here who ever 
played or heard of Zork? Zork? That was, I think that was what, the first, uh, it was a texting game, kind of like a, I don't know if you would call, really call it a role-playing game, but it basically was the first texting game. I actually first saw it on a CPM machine. Who's heard of a CPM machine? Okay, if you go to the Smithsonian Institute of Washington, D.C., <laughs> you'll see one. I was very young, by the way. <laughs> right, it was basically a text game where it would, essentially there, you, know, you didn't have graphics. It would literally describe to you, you are in, this, you are in a cave. It is dripping water on the left or, or you know, to the north. You have a door on the left. You have a, uh, another chasm on the right. What is your quest? Oh yeah, I can't even remember what, what, you, what the quest was. But. And then you have to tell it which way, what you're going to do. Are you going to go drink some water and get sick and die? Are you going to go to the chasms? Are you going to go to that door? Now, granted, I was a little bit of an anomaly at the time, but how many females do you think actually were playing Zork? Yeah, very few at the time. It actually was the case that at the time it was very, very few. Look at the differences now. So when you're designing, you do need to think about putting aside these stereotypes and thinking about us as humans and what's really important in terms of what I'm designing. Who really is my customer base? Right. What do we know about things like human learning that is going to be consistent across my users? What do we know about how we deal with information that's going to be consistent across my users, knowing who your users are? Now, we've talked about ergonomics, right? Ergonomics is basically the design guidelines for products that involve physical interaction. Right, it's been around a while, there are a lot of guidelines, they tend to be pretty straightforward. But there's also something that's called cognetics, which is essentially ergonomics of the mind, or cognitive engineering. And that's basically looking at or studying our mental abilities. Some, a lot of people argue you're taking kind of like an engineering approach, looking at the engineering scope of this. Because the process of, think, of, of uh, thinking and approaching how you design for ergonomics is very, very similar to how you design for how we work mentally, how we interact with things. So with cognetics and cognitive engineering, we need to think about what do we do when it comes to how we think about things. Makes sense. That's what we should do. Right? Except, again, the problem is that when we look at a lot of interfaces, that's not how they're designed. They're not designed as if we have a good understanding of how things like short-term memory work or long-term memory. Right? They tend to be designed in ways that assumes that we have these cognitive capabilities that we don't have, like our short-term memory will last a whole five minutes. Does anyone remember how long short-term memory tends to last? Actually, it's, it's seconds. Yeah, 10 to 15 seconds. And that's it. That's your short-term memory. We're not even talking about your perceptual systems, where you're using something like, you know, rehearsal. It's very, very short. So I want you to think about that when it comes to designing an interface. So I'm going to give you a test later. Now, we can design successful interfaces. There are a lot of companies that do, right? We want to keep in mind what the human mind can and can't do, how long it takes us to mentally process information and do things, as well as physically do things. And here's another important one. What increases the likelihood of mistakes? Because we have specific ways that we do things very well and others that, all right, we do have some limitations. 